Hi class, welcome to this second lecture on the Gospel of John. Uh, I gave you a lot of main characteristics of the Gospel of John in that last lecture. Uh, this lecture only deals with the outline. I'll show you how the outline flows in the book and, and, and you can see how well constructed it is uh, from the beginning. Uh, so let's look at the Gospel of John in outline. Again, this is another Ethiopian uh, icon. The Ethiopian Orthodox Church is um, known around the world for the icons that they do. Uh, Amharic, the, or Gaze, the language that's written there, is a Semitic language, and it's pretty difficult to learn. Uh, even for those who grew up speaking it, it's hard to read it. Uh, so the, the icons at the Ethiopian Orthodox Church is, is a way to tell the story uh, of the gospel. And here you get uh, Jesus and two of his disciples. Uh, so if you want to go like a rough outline of the whole book of John, you get the prologue, which is only the first 18 verses, but it's key and crucial to the entire gospel. And we talked about that in the last lecture, so I won't kind of revisit any of that. Uh, the next two main sections are the book of signs. This is the uh, chapters where Jesus performs these seven signs. And then the second section is the Book of Glory. It's the Last Supper discourse, uh, followed by uh, the crucifixion and resurrection. And then chapter 21 is a, really an epilogue. If you read chapter 20, verses 30 through 31, that's a clear ending of the Gospel of John. Uh, so chapter 21 is basically uh, came later and was added on to the Gospel of John to create another ending, uh, something like the Gospel of Mark, uh, where the original ending is at verse 8 and 9 through 20 were added later. Well, chapter 21 of John is almost the exact same thing. So uh, as we said in the last lecture, John 1, 1 through 18 is the prologue. This is the information that the, the writer of the gospel uh, gives the reader of the gospel. Uh, so the only people in the entire narrative that know the, the prologue are the, the, the writer of this gospel, the reader of the gospel, and Jesus, right? And so everybody else misunderstands what's going on. But we know from the very beginning, the very first verse, that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Uh, in this um, picture of John writing, um, this painting of John writing the gospel, you'll see the eagle, which is the symbol of the gospel of John in the top left corner. Uh, so let's talk about the book of signs. Here's another, I just love this icon from uh, uh, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, and this is the, the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well, and you'll see the heads of Jesus' disciples in the whole town behind them. Uh, around this story. I just, it's a great icon. Um, but this is the book of signs where Jesus performs these seven miracles. And you'll see how the miracles are kind of interspersed throughout this, uh, or the signs are interspersed throughout this uh, section called the book of signs. Here, this is just chapter 1, verses 19 through 454. Uh, and it's, it's pretty cool because you kind of see how uh, the writer's putting this gospel together. Uh, the end of chapter 1 basically established Jesus and his disciples. Uh, and this is, uh, it's important to notice this because in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus was baptized by John. It's clear. In, J in the Gospel of John, it's, he, Jesus is there with John, but John never baptizes him. So it's uh, clearly in the Gospel of John, Jesus wouldn't even stoop to be um, uh, baptized by John the Baptist. He's He's already too divine for that. Uh, and then in chapter 2, uh, you get the very, the very first uh, section where Jesus uh, creates a, uh, turns water into wine. And so this is like the Cana to Cana section. He, st he does his first miracle in Cana. And then uh, at the end of this section, he does another, uh, performs another sign. Uh, so this whole pericope, chapter 2, verses 4 through uh, chapter 4 through 54, uh, bracket Jesus' first two miracles. So uh, in chapter 2, 1 through 12, this is where he turns water into wine. Um, and then the very next chapter is where he turns tables over in the temple. Chapter 2, 13 through 25. And notice where this is placed in Jesus' ministry in the fourth gospel. 
Uh, turning of the tables happens at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. After his first sign, he goes into the temple and turns the tables over. Now, in all the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, this is the last thing that Jesus does and is the reason why the religious leaders plot to kill him. Uh, so it was kind of the last straw in the synoptics. And here, this is the beginning of Jesus' ministry. So uh, the Gospel of John is doing something very different by having the temple scene at the very beginning. It shows his authority uh, with uh, over everybody, but also, also the antagonism between him and um, uh, this kind of the Jews uh, that we've already talked about, how he uses that phrase. Um, in such uh, kind of pejorative terms. The very next sermon, uh, the very next uh, uh, section is the Nicodemus story. And uh, Nicodemus, uh, he represents um, Jews who believe in Jesus but are scared to say so. So he comes to Jesus at night and he misunderstands what it means to be born again. So this is very important because Nicodemus kind of carries the, the weight of believing Jews who are afraid to uh, believe publicly. So uh, Nicodemus is carrying a lot in his character, um, but shows that, yeah, there were Jews who believed, but they were scared, and they were scared because they were going to get ostracized from the Jewish community. And this says speaks more to John's community uh, than the history of the event. In other words, Nicodemus embodies the, the antagonism and the, and, the, and the strain in John's own day when he's writing this gospel. Uh, the very next section, um, John the Baptist testifies again about who Jesus uh, was, and John himself says Jesus is the greatest. Again, no mention of Jesus being baptized here. And then it moves into this, uh, the Samaritan woman, uh, chapter 4, verses 1 through 45. It's a long, long narrative. Uh, and then this, the question is, like, who does the Samaritan woman represent? So Nicodemus is a believing Jew who comes at night. The Samaritan woman is a Samaritan woman who initially doesn't believe and is in broad daylight in the middle of the day. And so she really does kind of uh, embody uh, in her character these non-Jews who, in spite of themselves, uh, come to believe in Jesus. Uh, very important um, story, the Samaritan woman. And then you get this final section of Jesus healing the royal official's son. Royal here is interesting because it looks like some kind of imperial figure. This is a Gentile for sure. So it goes from Nicodemus, who is utterly Jewish, but doesn't get it, and scared to come at Jesus during the day. Um, then the Samaritan woman who uh, is not Jewish, but comes to believe. And then you get this uh, Gentile or Roman official son who's uh, healed. So there is this movement here uh, in the Gospel of John. Uh, the next section of the Book of Signs is 5, 1 through 12, 50. And here, um, it's interesting because there's this series of feasts um, talking about these religious ceremonies uh, that Jewish people observed. And Jesus is Adam, so Jesus is certainly Jewish and, uh, <laughs> and attending all these feasts. So check out how 5, 1 through 1042 is designed here. Uh, and you'll see how carefully constructed it is. So... Uh, here you get Jesus in the Sabbath in chapter 5, 1 through 47. It's in that, it's in that uh, story of Jesus in the Sabbath where he heals a paralytic on the Sabbath. So Sabbath is a, is a Jewish um, ho ho holy day. Uh, then he gets Jesus in the Passover in chapter 6. Uh, they, it's in that section where he does two... Um, Miracles. He feeds 5,000 people. He walks on water. Um, then you get this section on Jesus and the tabernacle in chapter, you know, this first section. Uh, it's in that, and then this second section on tabernacles, the Feast of Tabernacles. It's in that section where Jesus performs his sixth sign. Uh, he heals a man born blind. And this also is 
the consternation of uh, the blind man's family, his neighbors, and his religious leaders who really give, give him a hard time about it. Uh, and then uh, Jesus and dedication. So you see how carefully this is laid out, uh, dealing with uh, Jesus and these Jewish festivals or Jewish holy days. Uh, and then this, in the last section of the Book of Signs, Jesus turns towards his death. And this is where you get uh, the seventh sign, which is the, it's, all these signs are progressive. And the seventh one is where he raises Lazarus from the dead. And it foreshadows Jesus' death and resurrection. It is uh, a major turning point in the gospel. And it's kind of how he wraps up the book of signs. He, he the, the book of signs ends with this, the resurrection of Lazarus. Um, and it's from that of all things that people begin to plot to kill Jesus. Uh, and then this narration of the triumphal entry. So this resurrection um, kind of spurs people on to, to kill Jesus, uh, which is totally different in the synoptic gospels. And then this last section, uh, chapter 12, verses 37 through 50, kind of conclusion of Jesus' ministry and teachings. So the whole book of signs shows, um, in all these signs, these seven signs that Jesus does, it shows his divinity. And all of these episodes that he has, these dialogues and extended speeches that he has with Nicodemus, the Samaritan woman, the blind man, the man born blind, religious leaders, all of this points to uh, how divine Jesus is. And then we move from this book of the signs, um, and I, again, I want to reiterate these seven signs, turning water into wine, healing the Capernaum leader's child, or the um, probably the um, Roman official, healing the paralytic, feeding 5,000, walking on water, healing a man born blind, raising a Lazarus. That's how that's laid out. You'll see how, you see how those are progressive. So we go from the book of signs to the book of glory. And again, this is a sketch of an eagle uh, that's in Latin, Johannes. Um, this is symbolic of the Gospel of John. So the book of glory um, starts off with the farewell discourse. Um, and I'll, you can go back to the last lecture and look at how I outlined the farewell discourse. I talked about it more there, so I won't kind of rehash this. But uh, this is the major section of the Book of Glory, and it's completely unique to the fourth gospel. None of this stuff that happens uh, happens in the synoptic gospels, uh, and it's a long stretch here. So uh, it's followed by, so Jesus gives this major farewell discourse, and then it's followed by his passion, the, his uh, crucifixion and the betrayal in the garden. Uh, and you'll see how this betrayal in a garden, in a garden, is completely different from the Gethsemane stories in the Synoptic Gospels. Here, it's never called Gethsemane. Um, but in 18.6, uh, this is unparalleled in any of the Gospels. Um, all these soldiers came out to get Jesus, and he goes, who are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, I am he. And when he says that, all the guards kind of fall to the ground. So this is, again, you know, another divine indication, the I am statements. This is the most powerful one where it just knocks people over uh, inexplicably. So uh, this is completely different than the synoptic uh, story about Jesus and the Gethsemane story, where he's praying to God to take away um, uh, this, this cup. And here, there's no prayer like that at all. And then uh, the next section, Jesus before the religious leaders uh, and Peter's denial. It's a This is a really interesting section. I didn't have time to outline it here, but it kind of goes from one scene to, it goes back and forth between these two scenes of Jesus being before Jer the Jewish leaders and Peter's denial. And it's almost like a movie, uh, the way it goes back and forth. And then this final section, uh, well, not the final section, but this is, the, the section where Jesus is before Pilate, again, very unique to the Gospel of John, the way that's characterized. And then it gets into the crucifixion of Jesus, where he's nailed to the cross. But notice how Jesus is always in complete control, even during his execution. He's talking to people. He's talking to the beloved disciple. He's talking to Mary. Um, he's in complete control the whole time. 
until he willfully gives up the ghost. And then uh, the, you have this burial scene and the reappearance of Nicodemus. Nicodemus comes around at the end, which is significant because it shows in, in outline form how Nicodemus kind of rep, who he represents, right? Uh, these Jews who believed in Jesus but were afraid and didn't fully understand, well, some of them really do come around in the end. And so he carries the weight of a whole group of people here. And then finally, you get the resurrection story in chapter 21 through 29, which is completely different than the Synoptic Gospels. Completely different. So uh, read the resurrection story here. Uh, and, and compare that to what you get in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And just know that chapter thir- um, chapter 20, verses 30 and 31 is kind of the, the, the way the whole gospel is meant to end. You know, uh, these signs uh, and many others that aren't written here were written so that you may believe. Um, and so this, uh, this is the culmination of the gospel of, of John. And then somebody felt like uh, that wasn't the full end of the story, and you get this section here. Now, this is another Ethiopian Orthodox uh, icon of the, the baptism scene. This is John the Baptist and all his furry stuff, and this, he's baptizing Jesus, but we know that this scene doesn't ex- exist in the Gospel of John at all. Uh, but I just thought it was such a beautiful image, I wanted to include it. Uh, and it's almost like that. That's how the epilogue is. You know, hey, we have some more stories. We're going to throw it here on the end. Um, so it's debatable whether chapter 21 is written by the same author or not and things of that nature. But read it and see if you think the vocabulary and thrust kind of reads like the rest of this, reads like chapter 20 even. Uh, and you can kind of make that determination for yourself. So that's the Gospel of John in outline. I hope you've enjoyed the Gospel of John's uh, lectures. It's a fascinating gospel, and uh, scholars uh, kind of have, have spilt a lot of ink on the Gospel of John. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to send me an email.